I'd like to welcome everybody to the February 2022 edition of the Eastside Clinic. I'm Alex Brickoff, and I'll be your host tonight. Tonight's clinic is titled Lighted Utility Poles, Modeling a Lighted Utility Pole on an HO Model Railroad. And to present that clinic tonight, Paul Rising is here. Paul has fa fabricated many lighted utility poles for the PSMRE layout at the Washington State History Museum in Tacoma. Lighted utility poles are an often overlooked feature on many model railroads. So this should be a great clinic and hoping we can all learn something from it and apply it to our railroads. So this evening, uh, we'd like to, uh, to chat a little bit about, uh, about what we did there at the, at the Washington State History Museum. I had uh, built about 165 or 170 of these utility poles. And so I got, uh, got to be fairly efficient at building these. And uh, subsequently, members of PSMRE have been installing them. And I'll chat about that at the, at the end of the presentation, how that installation is, is going. Lighted utility poles are, are all around us, and uh, they're there for uh, safety and security reasons, you know, so that we can see where we're going uh, when we're traveling around on the streets. Issues of, of lighting, of course, relate to uh, what's called the luminaire or the, the light uh, source itself and its height above the surface that you want to illuminate and the frequency that these lights are uh, let you know how much uh, light you're going to actually have on a working surface. And uh, you can be the, the judge of what's appropriate for your particular uh, layout, but uh, we, we came up with our, our own thoughts about that as we move forward. Typically located at uh, busy uh, roadways, intersections and driveways, uh, rail and road crossings, and of course, not only are they uh, do they have lights on them, but they have cross arms uh, that uh, support uh, power and communications wiring and the occasional cat. So this is a, a picture uh, near uh, the Asarco facility there at uh, the History Museum layout where we have some some of these telltales. So the criteria. Uh, at the History Museum, uh, because uh, uh, at least before COVID, we were operating uh, on a monthly basis. And of course, all of us can be a little bit ham-fisted at times as we're <clears throat> operating trains. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they were durable. And the precursor to the lighted uh, poles was uh, doing uh, telltales across the tracks. And of course, they're, uh, they're susceptible to, uh, to that ham-fisted experience during an op session. And so uh, Gene Swanson, uh, who has uh, since passed, but Gene and I worked on that project and came up with uh, a way of uh, installing those poles, so you design and installing those poles and the telltales that proved to be uh, pretty durable. And th this is the, the picture of the uh, telltales that we, uh, that Gene Swanson and I uh, made for the History Museum layout, and those have proven to be quite durable. Uh, another uh, criteria for the lighter utility poles was future lamping, or as you might expect, relamping. Uh, you, you know, LEDs, which is what we ended up using, uh, although they'll last for a long time, uh, chances are they'll periodically need to be replaced. And of course, as any scale uh, modeler will, will want to, to do is to make things as uh, realistic as possible. So this is also a balance between realistic and uh, durable. So the components of, the, of these uh, power poles, the, the lighted uh, portion anyway, are shown on this, this illustration to give you some idea of the dimensions uh, that we used. Not that there's anything magical about these dimensions. I'm sure you can find lots of variation just by looking at a variety of photographs. Sometimes the poles are taller or shorter or the, uh, the lamps uh, hang out there quite a bit uh, further than, than what is shown here. But so uh, the first thing, uh, we wanted to make sure that all of the poles were able to be removed. 
because uh, you know who knows they might get broken off and so you need to replace them. So uh, we uh, developed a, a base uh, receiver for the pole, and then of course the the pole itself is basswood. It's uh, as indicated here on the drawing. Uh, it's three sixteenths inch basswood dowel, and they're hand tapered. You know, using some rough uh, rough sandpaper uh, to do that. Uh, there, of course, is the the light uh, bracket, which I'll get into more detail. And then there's the lamp hood. Uh, and this this drawing does not show the cross arms, but I will in subsequent drawings. And then, of course, you need to contain the the electrics that uh, get the power to the LED and that runs down a groove that's in the back of the bowl and it comes down uh, through the base and to under, uh, under bench work wiring. And so I'll, I'll leave this a minute here so that you can kind of see what we used as some dimensional criteria. But we have uh, brass two here that the wire is running through. Uh, we have uh, a brass strut a rod that comes down like this. Uh, there's also a little brass tab that sticks up right in here, and I'll show you what that's for uh, in a little bit. And uh, each of these poles, I use my little uh, Micromark table saw to cut a groove down the backside of the pole, and that's where these really, really thin wires uh, go. And that, uh, once those wires are in place, that's capped uh, with a styrene rod here. And then the whole thing is, is uh, painted and you can't hardly even tell uh, that, there's, uh, that there's that rod in there because uh, it's round shape going into that uh, rectangular notch uh, just uh, nicely disguises itself. Uh, this brass tube underneath here uh, has you know, it's it's quarter inch tube. Uh, and then there is a brass washer that's soldered onto the bottom of it. And of course, the washer has a hole in the middle of it and that allows the conductors to go through. One of the things I'll mention as far as the installation of this, I've talked to uh, uh, a couple of PSMRE members here about a month ago and uh, they were installing these like gangbusters. And what they found is that they used a, a large uh, needle um, that they could just fish the, you know, put the wires uh, right through the, the eye of the needle and just poke it right down through this hole and then pull it out the bottom. So uh, that is done easily. Now, one of the things that's important is that, uh, that this uh, brass base uh, gets installed uh, solidly into the bench work. And sometimes there's a bunch of gyrations that you have to go through depending on what you've got underneath. Uh, but once you have it in reasonably solid materials, uh, what we would do would be to use um, a Gorilla Glue, which is a, a urethane glue that's water activated. So I drill the hole, uh, get everything set uh, appropriately, put the glue on the outside of the, of the brass tube, and then spritz the hole. And then you stick the tube down in there. And uh, you'll want to make sure, of course, it's as vertical as you can make it. So I uh, found a, a, a drill bit that was uh, just cleared the inside dimension of this and uh, glued one of these little bubble level devices on the top of it. And that's what I use for leveling these. So you get it in as best you can. Uh, initially, and then you go ahead and after about, about an hour, while things are still workable, uh, then you can go ahead and, and uh, uh, level it up, if you will, uh, appropriately. And then you'll probably have a bit of ooze of the glue uh, to clean up afterwards, but that's no big deal. Uh, yeah, and so the, the resistor and uh, rectifier and the power source, of course, is all under the bench work. So you're just running these fine wires down through here and then you do all the other work uh, underneath. So this is what these uh, uh, pole receivers or supports uh, look like. Uh, uh, looks actually like a little little cartridge for a uh, ammo, uh, but it isn't. <laughs> so it's just it's just the 
the brass washer soldered on the on the base of the of the tube. And these materials I just got at my local Ace Hardware. So, you know, nothing fancy about it. Secured with adhesive uh, in, the, in the bench work. So here's what the pole looks like. And uh, it's, of course, the raceway for the electrical wires. And this is that groove that was cut down through there using my uh, little uh, table saw. And of course, the uh, the pole not only supports the lighting bracket, but it, it uh, supports the, the cross arms. Uh, this is just uh, basswood, uh, once again, purchased uh, at the uh, uh, Hobby Lobby or uh, other art supply stores that have the, you know, the supplies of the small uh, cut basswood. And as mentioned before, this is all taper sanded before you do much of anything else. <clears throat> And then you need to prep it for the cross arms, uh, which is, uh, of course, what these notches are here. Uh, and that's just done with the, uh, with the table saw, so just uh, draw some lines, uh, the appropriate width across there and, and uh, run it back and forth across the saw. So here's what a single cross arm uh, light uh, looks like. And you know you can have a cross arm with insulators here, or just you know you can you've actually seen I'm sure poles themselves with just insulators. Now we chose not to try to get into anything fancy like wiring, uh, and the insulators, the insulators that you saw were just as small a little glass uh, jewelry beads uh, that I could find at uh, at Hobby Lobby, quite a few of them for a relatively low price. And you don't want to be uh, installing these cross arms until, until after you've done all of the, the lighting work because you'll just damage them uh, in the process. You, you notice what's happened here is the pole has just gotten taller uh, rather than the light moving down when you start adding cross arms. And so we wanted one, two, and three cross arms just to add some uh, variety. Uh, run along the, the roads and other locations uh, on, the, on the layout. And you can also do these uh, brackets for the lights uh, uh, kind of a little bit different than, than what we ended up doing with the bracket uh, angle, uh, angling down. Uh, you can also angle them up, you know, it's just another option if that's what you prefer, because you'll see them out there that way. So here's a detail of the upper end of the pole where the lighting bracket goes in. So there are three pieces, three brass pieces here. There is the tube that is the main support for the, for the lamp here. And then there is a really small brass wire soldered right here. And it'll be soldered, you know, and just sticking out straight. But it'll be used to uh, capture the end of this brass tube. And then there is this angular uh, bracket, heavier uh, brass material here. As you can see, this is 32 thousandths and this is 20 thousandths here. And so those are uh, soldered together. And, you know, as you can imagine, you, you can set up a jig and just go to town making gobs of them. Uh, once again, all soldered connections here. And I wanted to have good mechanical connections to the, to the pole here and here. So here's what that looks like uh, before it's been painted. So you got your tube, small brass rod, and larger brass uh, rod that's angled and turned into a support bracket. So first thing you need to do is to uh, drill the, the hole through the, you know, after you've got your groove down the back, you drill your hole appropriate size to fit the tube in here. And then once you've got that in place, then you can position where you want the hole to go in on the diagonal to, to uh, and I just use pin vise here, to drill these in uh, to uh, put this bracket in place, the brace in place, I should say. And so installing it, and use waterproof uh, glue here at these contact points, so you, you uh, uh, stick uh, this lower bracket in through this hole and you kind of wrestle it in there. And so it nests down into the, uh, because this is bent now, it nests down into the, the groove that you've made. And then you push the tube back up into the hole here. And then once that's in place, 
Remember that little skinny rod that's, that was soldered up here? It gets bent upwards into this location. And both connection points are glued with a, the good quality uh, waterproof glue. So here's what the electrics look like. We used a, a Pico size lamp. So that's a really small lamp. And, uh, and so I happened to get these from, uh, uh, from Lighthouse uh, LEDs out of Medical Lake, Washington. Uh, there are other manufacturers and they're showing up all the time. I initially thought uh, we were going to be using the uh, Evans Design product, which is a very good product, but it was quite a bit more expensive than the Lighthouse product. This came in kind of two components, and they made a batch of, I think it was at least 200. That was the minimum size special batch that they would do with these wires of this specific length that we wanted. Uh, you have this inner one, and that's this is where that lamp is. You can see that it's hardly noticeable at the end of these wires here, but you'll see that it gives plenty of light. And that's what's going through that tube, down the back side of the, the pole, uh, through the receiver and down underneath the layout. I can't remember the exact length that they made these things. I was at least a foot. Uh, it could have been a little longer, I can't remember. And then it gets connected uh, to these these wires where the power, you know, this is our 12 volt connection here. It goes through the resistor and then these, this connects to, to these guys down underneath the layout. These are the, just the general criteria here. And uh, the lighting uh, was gonna be controlled uh, by a uh, specialized uh, power source that can turn on uh, lights at different times. And uh, you'll have to talk to others at PSMRE to get the information on what was planned there. I was responsible for the, for the poles and, and these, these particular lamps here. And I don't know really much about the rest of it other than it, it had that 12 volt criteria. So the lamp hood. Uh, there's a variety of ways of doing these. I wanted something that was kind of fairly typical. And what I found uh, to work the best was this kind of this teardrop shape uh, bead. And this is acrylic. And it's, uh, you know, it's got a hole through the middle of it because as a jewelry bead, it's designed for putting on a, being put on a string. Uh, or on a wire, and uh, and so that's that's what was used. I needed to size the hole in it for that bracket, and as it turned out, the hole in there was pretty doggone close to that brass tube that we were talking about earlier. Now you don't want any light leaking out of it. You want it to be a hood like a reflector hood, and so the first thing that uh, that I did is to paint it uh, uh, black, flat black. Uh, spray painted it. And then I uh, put the finish color in this. I think that both the arm and the lamp wood was what's called steel uh, color. So it's not quite a galvanized. I mean, you obviously could, uh, could do a variety of things. You could use a uh, more of a dull gray color like a, a galvanized steel, but this is what I chose to do there. Uh, and then you, what you do is you, then you start beating up on it by grinding it flat. So you take it in your hands <laughs> as best you can and you, and you grind the, the, the face off. But now what I think I ended up doing is to, um, it's a little bit of a trick, but to, you, you run a, a brass rod uh, through there of uh, the appropriate size. I usually put a hook on the end of it. And then I use my grinding wheel to get to get most of the most of it flat, and then I finished it off running it on along some uh, some uh, emery paper or sandpaper to get it smooth uh, and and relatively flat. Then the next thing that you do is that you drill a hole at the LED location. So that's what this is right here. And so the the lamp, the LED lamp, will be in this hole area right here. So that obviously isn't going to go all the way through. You just need to get down. Uh, deep enough so that you're exposing the hole that runs through there. And speaking of that hole that runs through there, you don't want any light shining out the end of this because that would be non-prototypical. Uh, so you take a styrene rod and you glue it into the end of it and you do a little bit of touch up with your black paint and, and your metallic colored paint uh, to, to finish that off. Well, what I did is you put the 
put the lamp and the, and the wire through here, and then you just gently snug this hood on there because as it turns out, the Pico size lamp and this, this brass tube are virtually the same size. And so it does not really get in the way of you sliding uh, the hood over the top of it. And you can secure it or not. I just made it tight enough so it really wasn't going anywhere. And if you ever needed to uh, replace the lamp, that it's just easy enough to pull it off there and replace the, the lamp and the, and the wire. So the wire that uh, goes down here, obviously you're not gonna replace just the lamp if you needed to, to do that. You'd replace this, this whole arrangement here. And so you uh, can just uh, with a uh, X-Acto knife, just pry the styrene rod that's the, gonna be the closure on this off so that you can pull the wire out replace it and then and then put it back. So here it is, you know, in place. One of the things that uh, that you'll find is that uh, wooden dowels are not exactly the same size all the way. That's been my experience. What I ended up doing to make sure that the fit was reasonably snug in the in this brass receiver is I uh, took made uh, one inch strips because the brass receiver is about one inch here, uh, one inch strips of tracing paper, uh, the really thin stuff, onion paper type of stuff. And I would uh, smear some uh, white glue on it, wrap this, and then make several wraps around it, cut it off, let it dry, and then see what would, would uh, fit the best. And once that was, was done, it was pretty easy to, uh, to make sure that all the rest of them were a nice snug fit. Uh, not so snug that you couldn't pull it off or you'd end up jerking the brass uh, receiver out, uh, but uh, just snug enough so that it'd stay nice and vertical and uh, keep from wobbling. And if for some reason you get that a little bit too big, it's really easy to sand that down just a little bit uh, once, once it's nice and, and dry. This was the, the test platform, if you will, wanted to make sure that the spacing that we were talking about was going to be adequate. So these, you know, uh, wires down in here and, and uh, was run out, connected uh, to connect the electrics under the bench work. And then this is a, uh, a picture of what it looked like, a totally dark room. Uh, that's what it ended up uh, happening. You end up with a pool of light about 16 inches in diameter. And so we chose to do the pole spacing at approximately 12 inches. That's, uh, that's kind of the long and the short of it. Are there any questions? I get compliments at train shows for creosoting the base of the pole. So essentially just a little bit of black stain down there toward the pole bottom, just so that it would show four sure. to six inches above the the grass or the shoulder of the road? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, that was one of the things that was discussed as, as they were being uh, installed. Also, if you find that the, uh, the base of the, you know, this brass receiver tube because of some obstruction below or whatever uh, is, is a problem of getting it, getting it all the way down in the ground, uh, you can, you can you put that black on there and then, you know, just put some uh, dirt or, or gravel around the base of it as well. You, it's not uncommon to see the installation process evident <laughs> at the base of a utility pole. Paul, what kind of table saw did you use? It's a little micro bark one that's about, I don't know, uh, 12 inches across, 12 by 12. Okay, so probably the typical micro mark one I've seen in their catalog. Yes, that's exactly that's exactly what I have. Yeah, I've had it for quite a number of years and find it really handy for doing these little projects like this. Yeah, Paul, I made some uh, similar uh, uh, lampposts. And rather than having to saw the groove down the pole, is what I used is 18 thou uh, tubing. Put the two wires through that. Both wires were uh, 33 gauge magnetic wire. And they thread through the uh, 18,000 tubing very nicely. And they just glue the tubing on the back side of the pole and just looks like a conduit. Sure, sure. And that would actually be fairly typical for a modern 
uh, pole where the power source would be run underground and it's yeah. and it's just uh, but but back in the day of course the most everything was run overhead so right yeah right. i thought about that but uh, but yeah you're you're right that's that's another way of doing it that's another way of doing it and also i used um the uh, three millimeter uh, leds and use the uh, the prongs from the led to actually make a holder just like yours in other words, one prong goes straight out to the pole and then through the pole, of course, with the wire. Then the other prong goes down on the angle like yours as a support and it comes out and the conduit was actually at the top of the bottom one. Um, so you just have this little 33 um, gauge wire that goes from the top down into the, um, the conduit. Yeah. And, and the wire is so small. So it, I, I don't have the skill to... Uh, cut a, a groove in a pole like that. And I did have to get a friend who's got a, a very small drill press to actually drill the holes for me in, in the pole, because I don't have the skill to do that either. So it worked out quite nicely. Um, I don't know if you've seen Luke Towen's uh, uh, video on making light poles like this. What he uses for the shade is the uh, bag feet. I don't know if you know what bag feet are. The uh, women's handbags, uh, they have these little feet on the bottom of them. Oh, uh huh. And I got the smallest ones I could find, which were eight millimeter. Um, so it, ma it made a nice, uh, it's too bad I don't have one here to show. It made a very nice shade. Um, you sort of put them upside down, of course, from the bag feet. So the bag feet, with it, and you have to drill the hole just a little bit um, on the back side of the bag feet. And the uh, three millimeter LED fit very nicely in there, and just a little touch of. Uh, Super glue held it in, so yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My, light, my light looks very similar to yours. This may be a larger um, light shade. That's all. So yeah, uh, good, good work, good job. Thank you. If you're using conduit on the outside of the pole, have you had any issues with copper theft? Uh, <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Painted a different color. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, yeah, I painted it sort of a dull gray, like, a, like it was a conduit going down the pole. It looks, it looks very sharp, actually, and it also keeps the wires nice and straight rather than trying to glue the wires to the pole. Your idea with the groove actually solves that too. It keeps the wires out of the way. If you can't cut the groove, eighteen thou um, tubing. It's amazing how small that tubing is. It came from um, engineering. I think you fellows are probably aware of engineering. I think I think he's in Washington State there. Hey, Paul. I yes. was uh, curious about your in, in insulators that you use. The uh, the beads that you uh, have on your pole there. Yes. Uh, how, how do you attach the beads? Just with glue. Just with I just use wood glue. Okay. Yeah, nothing fancy. And of course, you you need to use a tweezers and so forth to do that. Did you use a jig for spacing? Uh, I will, typically what I will do is I'll do a drawing that I'll overlay with a little cross hatch on it or something like that so that I can just put the, put the cross arm on there and then just drop the, I put a dab of glue and then just drop the insulator on there and make sure that it's, it's square. Wish I'd known this some years ago. I used short little pins and pressed them with pliers down through the basswood and there's no way of getting them exactly the same distance yeah well you know there's some things that are uh, are worth securing in that way and some things that aren't i know that i've seen i've seen kits for these sorts of things that that do that and seeing those kits i thought you know it's 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 really oversized it's it's tough enough to make these things durable and keep them reasonable size to to prototype and and I would say that these are these are pretty hefty in comparison to for instance like the Ricks uh, power poles that you see those are quite delicate and if that was made out of wood there's no way they'd survive getting bumped by hand and so uh, and you'd never get the wires in them this is this is a compromise it seems to work pretty well and particularly when you like most anything in our hobby you stand back. Uh, a couple of feet. It's painting the picture, even though it may not be uh, a perfect scale. Glenn Farley uh, was experimenting with 
a 3D printed cross arm with beads, it would require painting and isn't looking like exactly like natural wood, but its profile would be a all in one, a molded cross arm mm -hmm. plus insulator. Then you can yeah. get the prototypical uh, scale. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see how these things hold up, you know, particularly with the cross arms. I think that the, the light uh, bracket and so forth is pretty durable. Uh, the cross arms, uh, I know that we had installed a ton of the Rick's product uh, at the museum and the cross arms were constantly getting bumped and knocked off. Uh, and so I'm hoping that these will survive uh, a little bit better, but only time will tell. I just remembered I got my uh, lamps right behind me. I know it's hard to show things, the, the bag feet for the shade, two leads for the LED. And then I don't know if you can see on the backside, maybe a little hard to see, but the uh, the 18 gauge tubing goes down as the as the conduit down the pole. Oh, yes. Uh, it makes not, not a bad looking pole. Yeah, yeah, very good. What's the diameter of the pole? Is that a quarter inch? I believe. And one thing you said, you taper your poles. I, I should have maybe tapered this. Yeah, I know, I know poles are tapered a bit. Uh, I could have I could have tapered it. Yeah, one of the things that's uh, uh, I guess it's a subtlety that I should have mentioned is that uh, you cut your groove and then you taper your poles because it makes it a lot easier to uh, to hold the pole you know along your your guide uh, right. if it's not tapered. So. And then, you, of course, you just need to make sure that the groove is deep enough that by the time you do some tapering, that it's still of the appropriate depth to get the wire in at the top there. Paul, did you mention how you tapered your poles? Uh, I did, but uh, the the I just used uh, some uh, fairly rough sandpaper, you know, some medium sandpaper. Held them in one, you know, one hand, and and uh, you know, one of the things that you can always do too is uh, is cut your poles a little long so that you've got a I'm gonna say a working end on it so that you can get a hold of it with something if if you can't uh, keep a hold of it with your hands and and then do the work on it and then you know cut it to the appropriate uh, length later on. Okay. 